Okay. So thanks very much for the invitation, Jerry. And I think this is a really nice contribution to keeping science alive at a time when it's very challenging. Uh, I hope all the people that are on this uh, uh, talk uh, are healthy and uh, doing all the right things to uh, help the world uh, overcome this uh, very challenging time. So what I want to tell you about today is about a technique I've been involved in for the last 25 years. Um, it's really taken me from a very broad set of synchrotron experiments to something more focused, but even within that focus, there's a tremendous uh, variety of things that one can do. And I think if nothing else, that's one of the uh, main messages I'd like to get across. So uh, what I'm going to tell you about is work uh, sampling of work I've done both at the Advanced Light Source in Berkeley, uh, Canadian Light Source in Saskatoon, and uh, the Soleil uh, Synchrotron in France. I'm going to give you one slide that's way too busy to tell you uh, or give you highlights of some of the things you can do with the technique. Focus on the spectroscopy access uh, aspects and the essential uh, nature of tunable synchrotron light as uh, the core of the technique. Tell you about how uh, we actually make uh, spectral microscopy measurements that can really take apart samples in a very effective way. And then the first break will take place. And then I will do a focus section on uh, work on uh, polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell cathodes, another break, and the final part will be on uh, something in the area of uh, biology, understanding how a certain class of bacteria make uh, absolutely exquisite single crystal uh, magnetite uh, inside their cells. So I will acknowledge at the beginning the essential role of beamline scientists, uh, the advanced light source, David and Tolak, and a Canadian light source, Jan, uh, in making all this science happen. So uh, just as one example uh, of uh, some of the things we've done in the past, uh, one of the first soft x-ray tomography experiments was one which was uh, uh, putting together a lot of interesting aspects about soft x-ray uh, microscopy, and that is that you can penetrate through a couple microns of water. So these are actually some uh, particles that Dow puts into paint. They're polystyrene, uh, nanospheres with a fill of acrylate which can act as a carrier for various uh, dyes etc. And uh, what we did uh, uh, was to actually uh, do a tomographic measurement at multiple energies in the oxygen edge in order to study the distribution of a polyacrylate fill inside these uh, polystyrene shells. And uh, there's a movie, I don't know how well that will go across the web, but uh, this is basically the core of these uh, polystyrene spheres uh, with the acrylate. You can see that many of them have broken and released their fill. Others haven't, and we're actually um, quantitatively measuring the amount of a polymer component inside another polymer component inside a shell of water inside a glass tube. So uh, quite uh, an impressive feat of uh, uh, measurement, analytical measurements. Second example, which I'll show again in a little more detail, is uh, one of the very first measurements uh, uh, we did actually with a new generation of microscope uh, about 2001. And this is a, uh, just a sample of a natural biofilm. Again, it's a wet sample sandwiched between two silicon nitride windows. And at the bottom, you can see the uh, analysis uh, of the three of the about eight components that we can actually uh, identify and map uh, with uh, this particular sample. The third example is also in the field of biology, just to motivate. Here's a picture from space uh, over a, about a uh, month period uh, in 2001, showing the growth of a uh, reflective uh, set of uh, material in Lake Michigan. Uh, and this material is actually uh, dead cyanobacteria where the uh, uh, supersaturation of calcium and carbonate have uh, made the uh, bacteria crystallize calcite, uh, which uh, stops them being suspended and inanimate uh, and turns them into basically a set of uh, calcium carbonate coated uh, bacteria. And in collaboration with Martin Ops, we did some detailed studies of this class of bacteria to try to find out uh, how the uh, species adapts to supersaturation of calcium and carbonate. Uh, using the calcium 2P edge there, you see the differentiation of a spectroscopy of basically the uh, in solution or uh, adsorbed amorphous calcium versus uh, two mineral 
uh, allotropes of uh, calium, calcium carbonate, carbonate uh, aragonite calcite. The aragonite is uh, much more easily dissolved in water. And so if they can guide the formation of the uh, calcium carbonate uh, into aragonite rather than calcite, they're better able to adapt uh, the, uh, their, uh, to their habitat as one gets into a, a supersaturation condition. And what we also did was tomography on that, but I'm not going to show you the tomographic data, uh, where we basically captured uh, the first initiation of the calcite crystallization, which sort of spells doom for them as the uh, system crystallizes into uh, the less easy to redissolve calcite material. Okay, so spectroscopy, uh, we all know in this community the power of the tunable synchrotron radiation. Of course, we have the ability to do elemental contrast because of the X-ray absorption threshold uh, that we uh, know uh, has a very specific energy for the different core edges of all the elements of the periodic table. What uh, the Stixon technique in the soft X-ray region really specializes in is using the fine detail at the uh, inner shell uh, edge, so the nexus rather than extended fine structure, or zanes if you like that term. And uh, basically, the ability to take exactly the same set of elements but arrange them in a different fashion and have spectroscopic changes is the power of the technique. Of course, uh, we like to understand all the spectroscopic differentiation, but a lot of the studies that people are doing basically is a fingerprinting approach where uh, one is uh, using uh, measured reference spectra or sometimes even spectra from a image sequence recorded on an actual sample to determine uh, the speciation and the mapping. So we can not only just look at uh, uh, materials that differ uh, in uh, structure, but also in phase, and that's important in the uh, fuel cell business. Uh, we touch on that a little later. Okay, so a final sort of example of spectroscopic uh, potential for using soft X-rays uh, is uh, given in this slide, which was a set of spectroscopy measured in a stixum at the NSLS quite a long time ago by Stephen Urquhart and uh, Harold Ade. And the only thing you really have to realize is that you make quite small changes in the uh, structure of the materials. For example, all of these various uh, uh, phenyl-based uh, uh, materials, you have some dominant features which can tell you this 285 EV picture that they all have a benzene ring, but very small changes of the other components give you changes at higher energies, which allow you to differentiate all of these species. Okay, so that's a bit of the motivation. Uh, how do we do these types of measurements uh, in the soft X-ray? There are four main classes of soft X-ray microscopy. Uh, the one that I'm focusing on in this talk is Stixum, Scanning Transmission X-ray Microscopy, where we use a zone plate to focus the uh, X-rays, two uh, monochromatic X-rays down to a small spot in space. And typically we raster scan our sample uh, through this focus while we're detecting transmitted light in order to make our images and then uh, spectroscopy, as you'll see in a second, by taking image sequences. One can also couple this arrangement to a uh, an energy, electron energy analyzer to do a technique called scanning photo emission microscopy uh, or to a x-ray fluorescence detector to do uh, x-ray fluorescence yield uh, trans, uh, detection. Um, and uh, there are two other variants. These, these are all basically serial. You take each data point one at a time, which is perhaps the Achilles heel of the technique because it's relatively uh, time consuming. But you can also do soft X-ray microscopy in the full field variants, one uh, called transmission X-ray microscopy, where you're using an optical train very, like, very much like an optical microscope, or uh, in a beam where you take a electron uh, imaging column, such as in an SEM or a TEM, and image uh, a set of X-rays that are, sorry, the set of electrons that are generated as an X-ray hits a sample and then gets magnified through the column. So I want to focus only on the Stixum uh, and uh, tell you a little bit more about how that uh, works. Uh, historically, this was uh, technique was uh, started in uh, about uh, 1980, a little after that, uh, but it was really until the early 90s when I started, people started doing the spectroscopic variant of it, and then the thing really took off after that. So basically, we have a... Uh, beam line on a uh, synchrotron, which uh, gives us uh, monochromatic X-rays. 
uh, and uh, the x-rays uh, are then uh, used to illuminate a Fresnel zone plate, a um, marvel of modern nanotechnology, uh, which focuses about 10 or 15 percent of the light down to a spot that in most instruments nowadays are, is of the order of 20 to 30 nanometers. Because only 10 or 15 percent of the light is focused, there's a lot of light that goes straight through the zone plate. You have to block that and you block it by a combination of an order sorting aperture and a central stop, which means that there's no direct line of sight through that optical train. The scan sample in most systems is being scanned to make images. There are a few now that scan the zone plate. There are disadvantages to that. And we basically uh, raster scan at each pixel you record, the amount of light that's transmitted, and you have classic uh, transmission uh, detection of uh, X-ray absorption. So just to summarize some of its capabilities, uh, as I've already shown some examples, chemical speciation through X-ray absorption is really the, the main benefit of the, making these measurements. Uh, Spatial resolutions routinely are in the sort of 20 to 30 nanometers. The sort of heroic measurements have been down a little bit below 10 nanometers, but uh, those devices really aren't practical. Uh, and my postdoc will be talking about tychography, which is getting us now routinely into the five, six nanometer regime in a few weeks time. Uh, energy resolution, typically these are not put on the highest uh, energy resolution beam lines, but because of the natural line width limitations, uh, getting uh, resolving powers of three to 5,000 is enough to get all of the spectral details if you want to cut your slits and take the time to make accurate measurements. The, one of the challenges of the technique is you need to make your samples thin, uh, so because we have to transmit x-rays. And it turns out that the many, many techniques that have been developed to make samples for electron microscopy work perfectly well. And a very good starting point in an, in an analytical application of Stixum is if somebody has uh, already started doing electron microscopy to uh, try one of those samples before making anything uh, modifications uh, to that. Uh, and you'll see already some examples of uh, measuring wet samples. Uh, I'll be showing you quantitative uh, chemical and magnetic mapping. And uh, uh, it is a, a, a possible to look at the uh, linear uh, dichroic signal to get molecular orientation, although I don't have an example of that in this uh, talk. Okay, so again, here's a movie, but I doubt if uh, it'll come through very cleanly. Where the uh, movie stops at specific points, those are points where you see additional contrast. And it's exactly that twinkling or additional contrast that one uh, makes a really good uh, stick some sample. This is the wet biofilm again, uh, taken just outside the river in front of the Canadian light source. Um, and you can see there's lots of rich information there. Uh, if we take just say three of the components that are basic components of all biological systems, proteins, polysaccharides, and lipids, uh, we can map those three components by uh, a fitting process that I'll talk in a little more detail in the next slide. And then we can uh, generate component maps, which we can make a color composite, as you see here. And what you see is the classic situation where these individual uh, bacterial cells uh, have actually a lot of lipids in them. They're storing energy. It turns out that uh, this has actually been spiked a little bit with nutrients, so it's probably a little more healthy than if it came right out of the river. And uh, each of the cells is uh, surrounded by a polysaccharide uh, in a classic biofilm type of configuration. Uh, because the uh, reference spectra can be placed on an absolute scale, uh, one of the nice things about using uh, transmission detection, uh, we can basically uh, invert the uh, absorption intensities at each pixel uh, for each component into a quantitative map with perhaps five or ten percent precision. And if you are on a beam like the one beam line like the one at the Canadian light source, which runs from about 100 to 2500 eV, you can cover almost all the elements of the periodic table. There's a core edge for pretty well everything. Okay, a bit more detail on the quantitative mapping. Uh, this is perhaps simpler to understand. This is a polymer uh, system that uh, is a collaboration with one of my colleagues, Harold Stover, where he's basically making uh, artificial structures, uh, microspheres, which allow, by controlling the uh, shell chemical properties relative to the core, allows to have controlled release uh, 
And so this is a set of discrete images through an image sequence at the CARP and 1S edge. You see below the edge, there's not much contrast. We hit the phi star, which the core is. It's got a lot of uh, benzene in it, uh, functional groups, and then uh, things change some more as we go to higher energy. So we can take a system like this where uh, the individual regions, the epoxy in the outer shell, uh, or the outer regions outside the spheres, or the core, which is a almost pure divinyl benzene, uh, uh, can be measured and we can convert these spectra to an absolute uh, intensity scale. So optical density per uh, nanometer. And this shows you, since you want to have an optical density around uh, about one optical density unit, so absorbing about two thirds of the light, one half of the light, uh, you need something like uh, 100 nanometer thicknesses of samples. And this ethylene glycol dimethyl acrylate is the component which uh, uh, varies with the controlled release properties of the shell. So we can take these reference spectra and we can use them in a fitting procedure where we take the optical density uh, at each pixel uh, as a spectrum at all the photon energies you've measured and fit it uh, to the set of reference spectra in optical density per nanometer. The coefficients of the fit then tell us the thickness at that particular pixel of that component. So we generate using AXIS or other software uh, a set of component maps. So this is the component map for the epoxy. This is the component map for the divinyl benzene, the core, and this is the component map for the ethylene glycol dimethyl acrylate, which is in the shell. And you can see the value of this from a controlled release point of view. You want to have porosity of the shell so that if you had a chemical contained in here that you wanted to have a slow release that might be happening over days or weeks, the controlling the porosity of this region uh, is one way to do that. And what you can see is that the epoxy here has partially penetrated this outer regime. And so being able to map the epoxy is a way of, in, the, in the shell is a way of mapping out the uh, uh, properties of a shell in terms of a controlled release and porosity type of uh, situation. So I think, oh yeah, so to emphasize again, because we have absolute reference spectra, which are relatively easy to set up, you just go to the CXRO database for X-ray absorption coefficients, take your measured reference spectra and uh, scale it such that the pre-edge and the high continuum usually more, more like 320 EV or higher for carbon 1S, is scaled to the optical density uh, response of the uh, element that you're dealing with. Uh, that gives you the quantitative reference spectra, which again gives grayscale component maps, which are absolute. And again, you can see roughly a 100 nanometer thick section that's been cut right here. And so we can combine these using uh, color composites to uh, see the mapping. And you can see very nicely the DVB and the epoxy are pure, but that the shell is purple because it's a combination of the red epoxy and the uh, blue uh, EGDMA component. So I think that's what I wanted to say about the basics uh, of Stixa. And I think if we wanted to hold, pause for questions now. Okay, so Should I stop sharing? Is that uh, no, keep, keep sharing. Um, so Evan asks that you showed uh, three columns of uh, carbon K edge data. Um, can you remind the authors uh, who the authors were for that and when this I mean, was published? Oh, for the, yeah, for, okay. the carbon, for the carbon data, can you give a citation? Yes, I understand. So Stephen Urquhart's on this chat. Maybe you can remember what the reference is, but that was published. Uh, what do you figure? Uh, 1998 or something like that? 2000 or so. Yeah, a little bit before. It was work that was done at the NSLS Stixon when uh, Stephen was a postdoc with Harold Dottie. I can give that reference around. I'll do that, okay? So, so I, ha I have a question also. Um, as a scanning probe, what's your dwell time and how long does this sort of map take? Okay, that's a great question. When we started really getting this up to a more routine technique, we wanted to target a very similar rhythm to what people are used to with analytical electron microscopy. So yeah. the actual dwell time that's sort of the default is one millisecond. We actually have plenty of uh, x-rays and uh, contrast in many samples. You could probably work down at about 
50 or 100 microseconds, so again, another factor of 10 or 50. So the problem is that our mechanical scanners can't typically move that fast, and our detectors are, are limiting us. So typically, that st the stats you're seeing are we taking uh, maybe between a half an hour and an hour. Uh, if you really can condense down the analytical information you want to say just a few energies, and I'll show you an example of that in the section on the uh, fuel cells, you can do these things in, in a few, few minutes, uh, or you can do very large areas to get higher statistical sampling. Right, so there's another question from Liana. How, how do you deal with testing for possible beam damage? Beam damage is a major challenge. Uh, at the same time, I would like to emphasize that relative to electron microscopy, analytical electron microscopy with core loss uh, techniques like EELS or X-ray fluorescence, we're about a factor of 100 better. So, you know, you're looking at the bad and the very bad. <laughs> so sure. this is one of the reasons why we scan at the one millisecond sort of rate, uh, highly sensitive polymer materials. Uh, like the one I'm going to be talking about next, you have something like 60 milliseconds to maybe a few hundred milliseconds uh, of focused beam on your sample before you make more than, say, 10 or 20 percent modification to the material. So we spend a lot of effort characterizing quantitatively damage rates and trying to find ways to reduce uh, the damage rate. We recently built a cryo stixum at the Canadian Light Source. And that certainly helps. Okay, so I think a final question before we continue. There's a question about um, about normalization, and can you, uh, in order to differentiate uh, multiple compounds, so can you comment on? I think you mentioned this, but can you re-emphasize how you normalize your reference spectra and the experimental spectra? Okay. So the experimental spectra are just in optical density. Uh, you want to have your sample thin enough that you don't have any extensive uh, absorption saturation because that, of course, will distort your results. Um, but assuming that's the case, then your reference spectra, if you want to do quantitation, you need to have them placed on an absolute scale. And a nice feature about X-ray absorption, I think many people are aware of, that outside of the near edge region, the response is simply determined by the elemental composition. So if you have a reasonable guess of the elemental composition and the density of the material that you're trying to quantitate, uh, you can place the reference spectra on an absolute scale, which we usually use the terminology of OD1, or optical density for one nanometer of material. And when you use that, then the coefficient you get out from the fit is the thickness in that pixel of that component uh, on a, a nanometer scale. Right. OK, uh, thanks. Why don't we continue? And if there's more questions on this stuff, we'll take those later, too, at the end. OK. Yeah. OK, so now I wanted to go in a bit more detail about a couple of specific projects. The first one is on uh, polymer electrolyte light membrane fuel cell vehicles, which my group has been collaborating with uh, various industry partners, Ballard and uh, AFCC, which is uh, Mercedes and uh, Ford, uh, to basically uh, apply the analytical capability of Stixum to some of the challenges they have on bringing uh, fuel cell technology into mass market uh, fuel applications. It is a successful technology. Uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Toyota is on record as saying that by 2050, he expects that they will have uh, gotten rid of all of their uh, hybrid vehicles and any uh, pure electric vehicles, uh, so battery, sorry, lithium battery vehicles, and will be uh, focusing primarily on hydrogen and fuel cell materials. Uh, we'll see how that all evolves, but uh, technology is definitely practical. And the core of the technology is electrochemistry. And uh, basically, you have uh, at the anode uh, hydrogen oxidation and at the cathode oxygen reduction, uh, and combining the protons generated at the anode transferred across a naphion type membrane to the cathode, which is then combined with the uh, O2 minus to make uh, water. So in a little more detail, uh, what the challenge is, is to make control the nanostructure of the electrodes such that you can uh, have them perform a bunch of functions. And I have a little animation in a couple of slides that this may be a better way of emphasizing what needs to be done. Uh, 
But basically the boundary between the membrane, which is the separator between the anode and the cathode, and the, the, uh, the cathode uh, electrode material is a really critical aspect. And how you actually control that interface and the internal structure of the cathode is really a uh, controlling factor as to how well the uh, system works. So here's an SEM of a cross-section of a membrane electrode assembly. So this is the electrochemical core of the material. There's a bunch of other stuff that's around this that's stripped off before we analyze these materials. And typically the overall structure is 50 to 60 uh, microns wide. Uh, and it's this uh, cathode region, which is uh, eight to 10 microns wide, uh, it's internal structure that we're trying to analyze. And uh, what's important and where six and really just value added is to map out what's called the ionomer, which is uh, typically a perfluorosulfonic acid component. This is a proton conducting electron insulating material. It's 100% the component of the membrane, but it's about uh, 30 to 50% of the component of the uh, cathode. And the reason it's essential in the cathode is that it's not enough to have the protons generated at the anode transfer across the cathode and hit that interface. They also need to be able to migrate inside the cathode to get uh, uh, to the catalyst material, which is typically platinum, uh, which is distributed through this whole 10 microns. So the distribution of the ionomer controls the distribution of the final reaction of the system, the OR oxygen reduction reaction. So what are some of the things that one wants to be able to do uh, in terms of helping uh, automotive fuel cell optimization? We would really like to help them optimize their uh, fabrication processes and electrochemical operation processes such the ion orbit distribution is optimized and it stays optimized over uh, the lifetime of the device. And of course, one of the factors that controls costing in this technology is the amount of platinum that's present in these devices. The more you can have the ionomer working properly, the less platinum you need to have. There are also issues that we've done with the uh, industry partners to look at things like platinum degradation, carbon corrosion, and optimizing water management. But I'm gonna focus primarily now on the ionomer uh, mapping uh, aspects. So basically, uh, what does that catalyst layer have to do? We have to get the protons through into a, a site where we are combining uh, the oxygen, which is diffusing in from outside the cathode, uh, to a catalytic site, which is typically platinum. There have to be electrons coming in to do the reduction, and uh, the product water has to be able to escape and at the same time not block the porous, porous channels, which are used to bring in the oxygen. So the nanostructure of this device is a critical aspect of its functioning and uh, being able to do studies on the right spatial scale is important. So this is how we actually map ionomers and uh, postdoc uh, Slava Bereshnov, who actually uh, worked with my group to develop this, is uh, really uh, his career took off because uh, basically FCC hired him uh, out uh, after we developed this technology to do the analysis uh, and basically bought out about 20% of the uh, CLS's stick some time in order to make the measurements for the company. But basically, if we look at below the carbon edge at 270 ADV, we see an image which is uh, uh, differentiating the uh, cathode, the anode, and the membrane. The membrane in this case has an internal structure, which is basically uh, a Gore-Tec type material at the beginning to give mechanical strength. Uh, if we then pop up to 285 EV, where you have the absorption by the carbon support material, which is graphitic, you see very nicely <coughs> the structure of electrodes, the anode and the cathode. Take the difference and we can see very nicely the carbon support defining the electrodes. If we then go to the fluorine edge and look below the edge, again, we have a very undifferentiated type of uh, system um, or image. And if we go on to the fluorine uh, absorption, we see very strongly the membrane, which has a large amount of fluorine in it. It's about two thirds fluorine. Uh, but if we take the <coughs> difference of the uh, on edge and pre edge, we see the membrane beautifully, but we don't see what we're interested in, which is the uh, ionomer and cathode. But what we need to do is to identify the boundary of the electrodes and the uh, membrane, which is really very well de defined just in terms of intensity. And so if we 
uh, basically threshold and subtract that signal, you can see there's a big change in the overall optical density here from 1.4 to 0.2. But now we see a, a nice map of the iron material. And this is actually a very idealized uh, system where we have a very uniform distribution. This is exactly the target that the industry wants and ha having a capability of uh, analyzing it, not just qualitatively, but also quantitatively because the response functions are uh, in an absolute sense, uh, gives a lot of value added as um, the manufacturers uh, modify their uh, fabrication procedures and uh, one can also use this for looking at degradation studies. So here's uh, where we actually started all of this. They were, the ASCC folks were very puzzled why they were getting this modeled picture in some of their <coughs> cathodes. And they had thought that what these uh, lighter colored uh, regions were was an, uh, a bunching up of the carbon support uh, and uh, um, that was actually the origin of the, uh, of the morphology. And they actually did this uh, based on electron microscopy measurements and what they didn't realize was the electron beam was basically ripping out all of the ionomer, which is, uh, this is essentially an ionomer map here, with the intensity of the ionomer. And so uh, the, the ability to, to uh, reliably measure the ionomer uh, gave us new insights into uh, how different preparation procedures can uh, modify the actual ionomer distributions. So, uh, and here's just an example that one of the things ASCC did once they, we realized uh, what was happening here and that this was actually regions where the ionomer was not properly distributed around the carbon support, um, they found out what uh, was the key to actually controlling that morphology. And so <coughs> here's a set uh, with a given particular carbon support where the amount of ionomer uh, in the formulation of the cathode paint was changed from 45% down to 13 weight percent. And you can see at these high loading uh, situations, you have a lot of this sort of ovoid and uneven distribution of the ionomer, which is the green component. Uh, but as that the amount of ionomer is going down, uh, we uh, get a more uniform distribution. But of course, it's a balance. They need to put enough ionomer to get the protons into all, where all the platinum is. And so they, they also did the same measurement on a different type of cathode, uh, where instead of ovoid uh, depletion regions, uh, they are getting a layering effect, but basically it's the same idea as they reduced the amount of the ionomer, they were getting more uniform loadings. So this is just an example of the sort of feedback to the company uh, that this type of technique uh, was uh, giving value added. And, and as I say, uh, my postdoc Slava got hired by them, had five years of nice employment with them, and is now working for a fuel cell uh, automotive co company in China right now. So the last thing I want to say in this segment is that um, while they were using 2D projection mapping to learn about their materials, we were pushing ahead to try to uh, get three-dimensional distributions of ion by doing tomography. And I'm not going to give you the whole story. This is one of the references that I have suggested people might want to take a look at. This is sort of the summary how we eventually learned <coughs> how to control the dosing by using very small numbers of angles, 14 angles, and a special uh, tomographic processing technique called compressed sensing that we published on. Uh, and really cut the flux a lot by doing partially defocused, but also just turning down the, the burner on the beam line. And by doing that, we were able to show by doing repetitive uh, scans, so a total of 45 angles and three passes over the angular range, we could show that we had essentially no uh, loss of the uh, ionomer. Um, in fact, I won't show the movie because it won't work very well over the web, but basically the movie, which you can access as a supplement to that paper, uh, shows not just the more or less uh, same results of the uh, Lanimer distribution maps in 3D, but it also shows the difference between the two and it shows preferential damage at the edges of these uh, ionomer rich regions. And so this is now at a total dose of around uh, 10 megagrays. The uh, critical dose for the ionomer damage as a pure material is something between 80 and 100 megagrays. So we're basically dusting off 10% uh, or so of the material. So I think that's uh, what I wanted to say about the polymer uh, electrolyte membrane fuel cell story. Maybe we'll pause for question number two. Okay, uh, are there any other questions? I see one from uh, 
Victoria, uh, um, do you know how these CCMs have been prepared? Um, uh, so the, these particular ones were uh, painted on a membrane, but there have been ones that have been inject printed. Uh, and then there's within the sort of paint type approaches, uh, there's a way of basically scraping a blade over it to get it nice and uniform. Some of them are prepared with that technique. Is, is that what the question's referring to? I believe or are so. you talking about the sample for Stixum? Sample for Stixum is prepared by microtoming. So basically the companies provide us with uh, the actual material they have in their fuel cells, which looks like paper, two pieces of black paper sandwiching this MEA. We peel off those uh, papers, which are gas diffusion layers, uh, and uh, embed the actual membrane, that 80, 70, 80 micron thick structure in an epoxy. And then we microtome that and look at that microtome section, typically on a TEM grid. Okay, okay. and there's, a, there's another question. Um, have you tried to do these uh, fuel cells in situ? Or, <laughs> or what's the prospect for, for being able to do that? Uh, I think ultimately it'll be doable, but uh, we have not yet succeeded. So just a little summary, uh, we spent a fair amount of effort in the last five years developing flow electrochemistry, got a recent red sci instrument on that, and we've uh, got another uh, set of students that are working on that. Uh, I think that's coming along very nicely. We've in parallel looked at an environmental cell for humidity and uh, temperature which is another part of the whole story. Uh, my plan ultimately is try to combine those two. Uh, the challenge is if you typically have gas flows of oxygen and hydrogen over a material that contains platinum, and you don't have a way of separating those oxygen and hydrogen uh, flows, I think most people will know what's gonna happen. <laughs> but platinum will catalyze the direct reaction. So we need to have basically a separator, but at the same time have it such that uh, we can keep access to the electrode and perhaps the electrode membrane junctions, uh, which is thin enough, uh, around 100, 200 nanometers thick, um, and yet still have the potential of running the reaction. So we haven't figured out how to do that. I think uh, the, uh, running the ORR is a half, half cell and uh, combining that with a more conventional metal electrode uh, might be the way to uh, actually achieve a true in situ cell. That's already achieved in the hard X-ray uh, and with neutron scattering and other techniques, but uh, in the soft X-ray, it's a real challenge because of the need for the very thin uh, samples. Right. Okay. Well, that, that's great that you're that you're uh, working on that. I have, I have a question about the uh, for the tomography. You talked about radiation dosage, and mm -hmm. you're, does that mean for when you say the 100 megagray, is that for uh, material loss or is that for chemistry changes? Uh, okay, so very good differentiation. <laughs> and if we have a microscopy microanalysis meeting in July, I'm going to present a talk on uh, cryo uh, yeah. measurements of this sample. Um, okay, so uh, Chris Jacobson's results would suggest that uh, cryo can stop mass loss, but not chemical change. We have some evidence that it looks like it may also, in this particular system, also slow down the rate of chemical change. So the loss that we're talking about is a combination of transformation of the fluorine environment. It's basically like Teflon, the, the backbone of the uh, ionomer material. And uh, you lose fluorines, you make carbon-carbon double bonds. Um, those are the things that are happening in terms of uh, chemical transformations. So there's a hard core of fluorine, about 30% of it, that persists even after you've really whacked it hard. Um, right. So. There's a basically a two-level damage process, one where you really dust off the fluorines very quickly, and then uh, the residual material damages much, much more slowly. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think, uh, why don't we continue, and we'll hold off okay. any more questions until the end. Okay, okay good. Okay, so uh, always fun to get your uh, children and grandchildren uh, involved. Uh, one of my little secrets of uh, my involvement in Stixum is that I commandeered my son, uh, Peter, who uh, actually is an absolutely superb programmer, and he helped write the software for running these microscopes uh, when he was in high school and first year university. 
and this is my grandson who's helping my collaborator Dennis Vasilinsky uh, collect an environmental sample where we're looking for magnetotactic bacteria. So these uh, magnetotactic bacteria like to live at a particular environment where there's relatively small amount of oxygen, but not completely in the anaerobic sediments. They need some oxygen for optimum life. And this little uh, band of uh, darker iron rich material is in fact the MTB from the sample that's been allowed to settle. And why do they make magnetic materials? So this is, if you take a TEM of a single bacteria, you see these beautiful single crystal magnetites that are all uh, magnetically aligned, making a little compass inside the bacteria. And that compass uh, combined with the light weight of the single cell of bacteria means that they align with your sphere, which except for right at the equator is more or less vertically with respect to the, uh, the surface of the earth. And that means that they change a three-dimensional search pattern to find this uh, correct oxygen level is reduced to a, a, a single dimension uh, search pattern because they basically just have to go uh, upward or downward along an oxygen gradient, which, which they also have an ability to sense oxygen levels. So that's what's the understanding of why these bacteria make these uh, magnetite single crystals. The reason that they keep them small is that uh, if you know something about magnetism, uh, at very, a very small size, it's below about 30 nanometers, uh, you can't maintain the magnetic direction. Uh, thermal energies will uh, scramble the magnetic orientation. And above about 100 nanometers, <coughs> the uh, magnetic materials will form self-closure uh, domains, which reduces the net magnetism. So there's a sweet spot between somewhere like 30 and 70 nanometers, uh, where each uh, single crystal maintains a single magnetic moment. And if you get them all aligned, you get a reinforced uh, overall magnetic moment of the structure. And so uh, uh, evolution has, in fact, led these uh, bacteria to uh, develop systems to genetically control the generation of these uh, uh, bio uh, mineralization in a very specific way. And uh, when we made our uh, SIXM and beamline at the Canadian Light Source, we actually made a very advanced elliptically polarizing undulator, which had beautiful capabilities for uh, using XMCD studies using the uh, circularly polarized light. And uh, I really wanted to find a niche where uh, we weren't competing with the big boys in terms of magnetic storage, uh, which is also a very important aspect of uh, soft X-ray microscopy, but uh, really looking at magnetism and biology. This is a really sweet area to look at. So basically you can actually see all details with an electron microscope. The fact that they have uh, total control over faceting, they're not the, uh, lowest index, uh, most thermodynamically stable faces faceting uh, typically. They, they're controlling this uh, mineralization in a very exquisite way. You can also measure the magnetism with uh, holography and electron microscope and other techniques, Lorentz microscopy. But what you can't do is see what's happening in terms of the chemical uh, sites that are uh, magnetic. And uh, this is where the soft X-ray uh, spectroscopy is really very powerful. If you look at uh, magnetite, these are uh, bulk uh, spectra done actually with electron yield by Goring's group and uh, Bessie. But you can see very nicely that uh, as you use uh, left or right circular polarized light, you get a change in the spectral absorption. And the difference, of course, is X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. And what's really nice about this particular system is that each one of these peaks, the down peak, the up peak, and the down peak, are sensitive to different sites in the magnetite. So there are three different crystal sites, and you can measure the magnetism of each of them separately. So you have uh, the ability also to look at different elements. You can substitute iron uh, with nickel and measure a nickel in, a, in an exchange system, all this sort of thing. So it's a very powerful tool. And so we wanted to apply it to these uh, magnetotactic bacteria. And so this is the first student, Karen Lam, who did it. And these are some of her images. And you can see you get, of course, wonderful uh, elemental and chemical contrast by sitting on a strong peak at 710 eV. So you can see the individual uh, magnetic uh, crystals. Uh, and uh, you can uh, do color composites. But in addition, we can also do the uh, 
uh, dichroism in Stixum so that we can uh, measure the XMCD. So here's just an example of this. You can see the spa so spatial scale bar is now getting to where we're really into nanoscale studies. And uh, here I'm just comparing the uh, uh, iron 2p spectrum uh, averaged over all of the magnetite uh, single crystals in these samples recorded with left and right circular polarization. And you see we ex see exactly the change uh, as is known from the bulk measurements. And we take the difference and we can quantitatively correlate our measurements with what's known in terms of the strength of XMCD in uh, uh, magnetite. In addition, we eventually found out that this deviation here is because of a preferential radiation damage effect. I won't go into that. Okay, so one of the things that we've uh, contributed to this area is to uh, show that in fact it's not true that the uh, cells are always uh, having their magnets in exactly the same orientation. So here, uh, this is an example measured at beam line 11 at the advanced light source. You can see the green ones have an opposite uh, orientation of the magnetic moment, and there's a gap between them. And we see this uh, many, many times, and there was a quite a, an extensive study by Sam Calaray uh, uh, documenting the frequency of this in one of the species we were looking at, MV1. And uh, more recently, we've been looking at the AMV1 species, and this is actually a single cell that just hasn't divided. And when we made the magnetic measurements, it looks like it's just playing games with us. It's altering the orientation of the magnetism in, in a strange way. So this is sort of uh, opposite to what's expected from the, uh, the current best hypothesis to why uh, it's beneficial for these uh, bacteria to make uh, these single crystal magnetic chains. Uh, because clearly in this sort of situation, it's going to have much less interaction with your field than you would expect if they were all aligned in the same way. And so this raises the question, what's controlling the uh, biomineralization? Can we use Stixum to help understand uh, the way in which they're uh, forming uh, these magnetic chains? And so uh, there's a technique called time course experimentation in bacterial uh, development. And uh, if you can turn off a given subsystem, <laughs> grow a culture, and then turn it back on in some way and follow it as a function of time, you can get insights into how that particular uh, biological system is uh, functioning. So it is possible to grow these cells in the absence of iron. And it's hard, but you can get them to do it if you control conditions properly. And once you have a non-magnetic culture, you can then spike it or add that non-magnetic culture to a regular media with a normal concentration of iron and then see what happens over time. So here we have an example of this. These cells are being defined by some sort of an internal balloon type structure, which is not relevant to the actual problem. But as we let the sample grow, you start to see individual magnetosomes, one or two at a time. This is after two hours. After four hours, we see some cells with some starting chains. These are all TEM images. And after uh, uh, two days, you can see that there's now proper chain formation. So in our hands, with our culturing capabilities, something in the one to two day range is the time over which we can actually track these uh, cells being uh, generated. But it's uh, not exactly an easy experiment. Uh, we have to use quite a bit of beam time to do all of the studies that uh, we uh, uh, want to do, but we were able to do that, uh, in particular working several in several uh, measurement periods at the uh, Soleil synchrotron with the Hermes uh, beamline people. It was a really a great collaboration. It's a great, great Stixum and a very, very stable synchrotron and beamline. A great place to do uh, Stixum science. So this is just a quick summary. This was the second of the two papers that I highlighted as something that gives you a feel for what you can do with Stixum. <coughs> Here what you see is the measurements over this uh, two-day period, sampling more uh, frequently in the low time period where, of course, the interesting things are going on. And uh, this is basically a uh, mapping of different sizes of the crystals as they are growing, the number of average particles per cell over maybe 100 cells being uh, visualized by TEM. Of course, we can do that in the comfort of our own uh, home institution. At the synchrotron, we had to do a much smaller sampling, 
but we were still able to do spectroscopic measurements, which gave us some interesting insights. So here's just uh, the six um, uh, images uh, showing you that at very short times, uh, there are some of these uh, single crystals, but they're quite large. And I'm pretty sure these ones are actually ones that did not actually get completely um, weeded out into our growing a non-iron uh, environment. But then at one day period, you're starting to see lots and lots of changes, chains, not as complete as they are in the end uh, run, uh, but certainly the cells have become very healthy in terms of growing chains. And the interesting thing is when we start to sample the spectroscopy as a function of the growth time, the early ones have this additional peak at 708.2. You have to be quite familiar with the spectroscopy to be confident that that's what that is. But this particular structure is characteristic of a pure iron-3 uh, iron oxide as opposed to magnetite, which is a mixture of iron-2 and iron-3 environments. And then by the time you get up to two days, you get spectra that are identical to the ones that we do on mature cultures. And so the last example here is just one uh, very nice sample that uh, Lucas, a uh, grad student who did this work, uh, measured in November of 2017, actually, where we see sort of the whole story in one cell. So this dashed line is an outline of the actual cell. <coughs> and if you look at this uh, blue uh, uh, area or this red area, both of these match very nicely the uh, spectroscopy of the pure uh, magnetite. This one here, which is much fainter, has much less iron in it, is showing more of the 708.2 EV peak, and this set, which we call precursor cells up here in green, really show this very prominent uh, 708 peak, which is characteristic of iron 3. This is a hematite spectrum. And so, uh, you know, there have been other evidence from hard X ray uh, iron uh, K shell studies and uh, NOS power suggesting that uh, the system goes through an iron 3 intermediate, but this, I think, is one of the really uh, single crystal, uh, uh, magnetite crystal inside a cell uh, type of measurements that confirm in a very positive way that iron-3, uh, there's a very, a phase in which they go through a, a lot of iron-3 and then they uh, bring in the iron-2 uh, later on. So we're hoping to continue this uh, at even higher spatial resolution uh, using the tychography technique, which uh, Hao Yuan will be talking about in a couple of weeks' time. Um, where we hope then to be able to really get down to the very small crystals that we know from the TEM are there in the sort of half hour to one hour period. So just in summary, I uh, hope I've shown you that there's a lot of fun things you can do with uh, SIXA. You can do it for nanoscience if you happen to have a grandmother, but you can also do it for nanoscience. So I've shown you some examples of looking at wet materials, uh, more subtle uh, measurements like magnetic measurements and then industrially relevant measurements like uh, the uh, PMFC. And again, I'll just give you a little teaser. Uh, <clears throat> all of this uh, analytical capability that we've developed over the last 20 years or so uh, using just uh, conventional sticks and shall we say is uh, now uh, going to much higher spatial resolution using the complementary technique of uh, tychography. So I think that's where I wanted to end. I have one slide here just with some references, uh, whichever one people want to look at, you can take your choice. Okay, thanks, Adam. That was, that was excellent. Um, are there any questions for uh, Adam on the biomineralization? Um, yeah, there's a question uh, uh, asking if uh, the OH and TD magnetic features of the XMCD for magnetite uh, change as the uh, as a function of the intercalant, or uh, uh, as a function of the intercalant. Oh, intercalant. <laughs> yeah, intercalant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, there is uh, some measurements uh, showing that uh, just straight spectroscopy measurements, not uh, spectral microscopy measurements showing uh, that the uh, OH and the octahedral and tetrahedral amounts can change. Uh, that's been done artificially by substitution. Uh, that's what uh, I was referring to, and I guess the questioner is also referring to. So you can substitute in uh, cobalt or nickel for uh, certain iron sites. And if I remember correctly, it's the tetrahedral site, but I may be wrong on that. I can, again, I can get the references to that uh, if uh, 
the person who's interested wants to uh, follow up. Uh, the group of uh, uh, John Lloyd and uh, Richard Patrick in Manchester have actually done a lot of that type of work um, where they were intentionally trying to actually uh, grow mixed metal uh, magnetite using bacterial techniques to, to, to make the, the magnetite. Um, yeah, so the, there is information known about that. The other thing is it's also possible radiation damage. One of the sites gets damaged more easily than another one. And so we had to be very careful about that at the beginning. I'm pretty sure that the, technology, that the techniques we're using now are not being affected by that. We, we can basically get a very good match um, to the bulk uh, magnetite iron two piece, right? There's a final question um, about the beam size for the magnetic uh, images you showed, or beam size and dwell time. Yeah, so uh, we certainly bumped up the dwell time in part because the software they're using is a little slower than other software, but uh, we're using typically five milliseconds and uh, probably about 10 megahertz uh, uh, photon flux rates. Um, and so, you know, there are slower measurements than we would do at the CLS or the ALS, where the software, it makes sense to do one millisecond. There's about a three millisecond uh, overhead because of the software, unfortunately. So if you wanna, if you wanna keep that dose that you're uh, applying to your sample uh, more useful, it's better to go uh, a little uh, slower and, and have maybe 30% uh, dead time. From the, Okay, well, thanks. That, that was wonderful. Um, in the interest of time, I think we want to uh, turn it back over to Jerry. I think he has some announcements about upcoming talks. So thanks, Adam. I think everyone uh, thought it was, it was a awesome. terrific talk, thanks. Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you could uh, stop your share, uh, Adam, I'm going to yeah, uh, put something up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. We've got Zoom is in my way, so I can't. Uh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, so the, we're trying to have talks every Monday and Thursday for as long as seems appropriate. Uh, these are the next two talks. Um, so uh, Dr. Kelsey Morgan from NIST is going to tell us about the uh, uh, the project on transition edge uh, sensors and transition edge sensor arrays, which many of you know are the cryogenic superconducting detectors with very high energy resolution that are getting used at uh, more uh, spectroscopy beam lines. And then on Thursday, uh, Martin McBriarty is going to talk about top-down approaches to extended XAFs analysis. Um, uh, all the details, including the Zoom links and the recommended reading, are at the schedule, which I believe all the uh, uh, Google sharing is correct on now. And of course, the recordings uh, have their own channel on YouTube. So share those links with your XFs friends. And um, I hope that uh, I hope that y'all will be back on Monday and you have a good weekend.